A hvala što ste došli da bi došli u Multimedia na studiju, tj. u MAMU, na drugo predavanje iz serije Program kapitaličkog rada, koji prispite ulogu grada, organizaciju života u njemu i urbane politike u reprodukciji suvremenog kapitalizma. Isto tako, znači ovo predanje kao i ono prošlo gdje je gostovao Nick Theodor, organizira Multimedialni institut i Grupa 22 zajedno uz podršku Hannibal Stiftonga, Ministarstva kulture i grada Zagreba. Velika mi je čast i zadovoljstvo da ovdje mogu pozdraviti koji će držati predavanje Margaret Mayer, inače koji će govoriti o protorječima suvremenog urbanog aktivizma. Evo vrlo kratko o gospođi Mayer, istaknuta njemačka politologinja i sociologinja grada od 90. do nedavnog umirovljenja je predavala na komparativnu i sjevernoameričku politiku na Fraja Univerzitetu u Berlinu, profesorica na Centru za metropolitanske studije na Tehničkom sučilištu u Berlinu. U svom istraživačkom radu bavi se komparativnom politikom, urbanom i socijalnom politikom te društvenim pokretima. Objavljivala je radu u različitim aspektima suvremene urbane politike, urbanoj teoriji, restrukturiranju socijalne države i društvenim pokretima. Su autorice monografije Non-Profits in the Transformation of Employment Policies, te su urednica zbornika Urban Movements in a Globalizing World, Cities for People, Not for Profit i Neoliberal Urbanism and its Contestations. Trenutno radi na monografiji upravo o urbanim društvenim pokretima i državi, tako da je baš nam drago da možemo ovdje ugosti da predavanje upravo o tim kontradikcijama i proturječima različitih urbanih društvenih pokreta, s obzirom na to na različite strategije kako se neoliberalni grad razvija. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'll give you the floor. Ms. Mayer. Thank you. What did he say? <laughs> <laughs> There were a few words that I did understand. Um, for example, that Nick Theodore was already here and talked about, um, I guess, the preconditions for my talk today. So I assume you have all heard or maybe read Nick Theodore's and Jamie Peck's and Neil Brenner's work on neoliberalization, which I have found extremely helpful to understand um, how cities have transformed since the Fordist period under this global um, impetus of um, of neoliberalization. There are obviously many other frameworks one could use, but if one wants to, as I do, um, try to understand the context within which urban social movements are um, challenging a hegemonic rule, then this framework that they have elaborated is most helpful because it allows us to identify the um, tensions and contradictions um, within that neoliberal <coughs> rule regime and and that's basically the reason why I'm turning towards or why I um, place my own analysis of urban social movements in the West within that framework. And so, um, rather than going into the details, um, which I assume you already know, of how neoliberalizing of cities has worked, I will um, simply go to the very latest stage of neoliberalization. We have been through various rounds of at first rollback, then roll out, and then austerity forms of neoliberalization. I'll go to the very contemporary stage and identify some of its characteristic features and, um, and then place some of the urban movements within that context. Um, and since there are many, I can only focus just on a couple exemplary um, um, contemporary urban movements, which um, manifest <coughs> to my mind um, particularly clearly uh, some of the contradictions 
within the urban social movement terrain. And then I'll look at that, mostly <clears throat> from my experience in Germany and some in the United States. And I realize, of course, um, even after having spent only one day in Croatia, that your situation is, is rather different in spite of the similarities between Fordism and the socialist planning period, but still, and it's very, very different. And I'll have to leave it to you to figure out what lessons to draw, possibly, hopefully, from um, this look at um, the German situation. So, um, this is a very good start. <laughs> Should always um, start by throwing out your water first. <laughs> it's just water, yes, exactly. So, I will first um, present four ways in which urban policymakers have recently been trying to deal with the fallout of the 2008 crisis as it has impacted on cities. And then I'll take a closer look at two particular strategies um, that directly shape the opportunities and constraints for urban movements, um, because I think they need to be particularly well understood for their ambiguous um, effects. And that is uh, creative city policies on the one hand and um, austerity politics on the other. Both of them I see as having a powerful impact on um, urban social movements, different, different strands of urban um, social movements. And then I will scan the, the um, thus restructured urban terrain for the specific potentials and difficulties that demands around the right to the city um, encounter today. So first, contemporary um, neoliberal urbanism. In a nutshell, um, I single out four features. First, in terms of the overarching political strategy, Neoliberal urbanism at this juncture is, as it has been from the very beginning, still characterized by, you guess it, the pursuit of growth. Nothing but unrestricted growth first. And urban managers still use various for forms of urban spectacles and signature events, whatever they can come up with, to accelerate investment flows into their city and to improve the city's position in the interurban rivalry. But contrary to earlier rounds of neoliberalization, due to <coughs> austerity, which many municipalities are now struck with, they focus more on um, um, less costly and more symbolic uh, forms of festivalization. So they will look for low cost ways to help um, culturally upgrade their brand. So low budget ways of uh, doing that may include such simple strategies as measures that facilitate setting up internet cafes, you know, doing away with regulations that used to constrain that, coffee shops, very good for bringing creative types like us into cities, right? But policymakers are also on the lookout for innovative, especially culture-led efforts to mobilize city space for unfettered growth. These cultural branding strategies often benefit while they incorporate some alternative subcultural urban movements as elements of such upgrading, particularly those movements that can easily be fitted into creative city projects while at the same time, in part through this very policy, further marginalizing groups that lack such 
cultural symbolic resources, thus aggravating their grievances and thus also triggering often anyways protests by such aggrieved <coughs> groups. So that was growth in a nutshell. Second, in terms of modes of governance, cities have been adopting entrepreneurial forms of governance in even more policy areas than they used to uh, in the earlier rounds. So they make use of presumably efficient business models, privatized forms of governance, which they have been complementing with an increase in bidding for investments, often speculative investments. This has entailed more out-contracting and a shift to task and project-driven initiatives, such as developing just a particular part of town or um, competing for mega events, Olympics, garden shows, building exhibits, stuff like that. In these endeavors, mayors and their partners from the business sector, often bypassing city councils or, um, yeah, the council chambers, they set up special agencies to deliver target-driven initiatives that focus just on very specific single object, objectives. To the extent that this type of governance uh, still entails the production of hegemony, this occurs now via small-scale involvement. So instead of the traditional modes of regulation that were designed in the traditional tripartistic, corporatist, and long-term ways, we now see very flexible, small-scale, and constantly changing concessions to shifting particular groups. In this ad hoc and informalized political process, global developers and international investors are playing even more dominant roles. And so it is increasingly them who shape urban politics and thus our urban environment. These strategies and their lack of um, transparency have also given rise to all kinds of struggles over representative democracy, or rather the erosion of representative democracy, as more and more residents who don't conform to the standards of the global developers are excluded from access to their city and decision-making about their city. So whole bunches of movements have popped up around that. Thirdly, um, in terms of the relation between the public and the private, there has been even more privatization of public infrastructures and public services from public transport, <coughs> utilities, to social housing, and it's especially the socially oriented institutions of the public sector that have been rolled back and reorganized or you might say disorganized in, in many ways, more disorganized than um, well reorganized and exposed to the market. In this raiding of public coffers, often by government sponsored private companies who are turning public infrastructures and services into options for expanded capital accumulation, by dispossession, privatization is actually turning into financialization as scarce urban resources are turned into speculative stock. Intensification of privatization has also pertained to land, to urban land. The extortion of maximal land rent works best through dedicating more and more private spaces to elite consumption, while the privatization of other areas, such as shopping malls or train stations that are still presumably public, but access to them has been more and more limited 
or the use of collective infrastructure like that has been made more expensive, thus reducing um, access to our residents. <clears throat> Even the Financial Times has uh, written that whole urban centers from Paris, Manhattan and London all the way to Singapore and Hong Kong are becoming, in their words, exclusive citadels of the elites. The middle classes and small companies are falling victim to class cleansing, writes the Financial Times. Global cities are becoming patrician ghettos. The author was a guy named Cooper. <clears throat> so we call these strategies enclosure strategies and they have also triggered a variety of contestations from protests against rent increases, occupations of social centers, to guerrilla actions in the semi-public privatized spaces of surveillance and consumption. Like there was a, a group in, in Hamburg that <clears throat> were wearing security guard uniforms and they went around and um, <clears throat> controlled people for whatever, right? But um, they were scandalizing the surveillance and the consumerism that is now ruling these places. And many people <coughs> didn't even notice that it was satire. Um, So, under this rubric fall also the protests against privatization of uh, utilities. And we have had, a, at least in Berlin recently, a successful struggle to re-municipalize water. And there's still a struggle over energy. And in many cities now, these kinds of struggles are increasingly successful and cities are being forced or themselves see the benefits of um, buying back those um, mm, utilities and other uh, commons. Um, all of these three um, strategies have um, exacerbated social polarization processes that have of course been kicked off long time ago. Um, but what has also changed now is the toolkit for dealing with these social polarization, um, in more intensive um, trends of social polarization. Formerly, we had um, area-based um, programs, um, like in Germany was called um, Social City, that would um, consist of some mix of neighborhood um, revitalization and activation programs. And they were envisioned to stop some uh, presumed downward spiral of blighted neighborhoods. Such programs have now been severely curtailed and um, increasingly are superseded by a novel two-pronged policy. On the one hand, there's more attrition and displacement policies that are pushing the poor to further outskirts of the periphery or to invisible interstices within the city. You know, some <clears throat> derelict places where nobody sees people. And on the other hand, a bunch of more benign programs seek to incorporate impoverished, marginalized areas as well as social groups into upgrading processes to thereby undergird efforts to attract growth and investors, um, and also, of course, to pacify um, or preempt potential protest from such um, poor people living in these areas. So we now find, for example, large development projects and urban spectacles such as a garden show and international building exhibits that are increasingly being set up in formerly industrial 
or social housing districts like in Hamburg, um, for those of you who know, Hamburg District Wilhelmsburg, which um, huge social housing projects are now renovated and they are hosting the international um, building exhibit with um, a very famous international board, including people like Saskia Sassen, who thinks what is happening through this project is protecting the residents and upgrading them at the same time. The local activists see things a little different and there's actually an interesting English language debate that you can follow on, on their website, both Saskia's website and AK Wilhelmsburg. Um, so there are also very interesting struggles um, erupting around um, these efforts um, designed to upgrade those neighborhoods and to induce, of course, in my view, a gradual residential shift um, with the controversial effects. So these four um, characteristic features I think are pretty important to capture the contemporary neoliberal city, but I will now focus just on two of them. Um, I already gave it away. Creativity is one key um, concept that has been seized by urban policymakers for urban competitiveness and a broad array of measures from attracting um, knowledge intensive services to subsidizing cultural and creative economies have been designed to foster a concentration of firms and of activities in the areas of new media, new technologies, fashion, advertisement, tourism, and cultural industries. The prevailing assumption is that only these types of creative industries will generate growth in today's first world cities because manufacturing-based growth has moved to regions with cheaper labor and laxer environmental standards. So in order to attract such creative industries, along with the so-called creative classes, always in inverted commas, and to attract tourists and to attract investors, urban managers have become enamored with image construction, place branding, and city marketing, while they continue to rely on ever-expanding gentrification and upgrading strategies. So as part of creativity-led economic and urban development strategies to enhance the unique brand of their city, policymakers have also designed specific programs and subsidies for artists and other creative professionals, thus fostering the emergence of conducive spaces for cultural or subcultural movement activists. They have supported also, so it's, it's the culture workers on the one hand that fit uh, into this set of policies and, and on the other hand, they have um, supported certain migrant communities. And this was interesting, especially in Germany, which for the longest time has defined itself as a non-immigrant um, country, while of course we've had um, immigrants from Croatia, Italy, Turkey, everywhere for the longest time. But we always claimed we were a non-immigrant country because they were supposed to go back home. But now uh, we are discovering the, we Germany, the entrepreneurial um, activities um, and talents that are now highlighted as evidence of and catalyst for a new cosmopolitan culture open to the world and very cosmopolitan. So policy makers now emphasize the need to welcome not only the globally mobile elites, business elites that have always been welcome, but with these new diversity concepts that are replacing outdated multiculturalism 
politics. They are now also welcoming the ground personnel of globalization. In this re-evaluation of soft locational assets, not only the informal economic activities of migrants and the cultural milieus of artists and other creatives have experienced a new appreciation, but also oppositional movements and radical squads, which in their own way mark urban space as attractive. Such groups, while still seen as insurgents, have increasingly received more positive attention than the primarily punitive and repressive type of the past. In fact, municipal politicians have made advances to movement groups, especially to those whose initiatives can well be tied into the local marketing and upgrading strategies to attract tourists and investors and so on. So radical squads, self-managed social centers um, fit into this concept because the sub and countercultural activists charge such spaces with cultural capital which then in the scheme of creative city policy becomes transformed by investors into economic capital. Formerly squatted buildings and open spaces and other biotopes which anarchists have spiffed up or precarious artists made interesting become harnessed by clever city officials and by real estate capital as branding assets that contribute to the image of cool cities and happening places. I come from Berlin. I've been, they've been very successful <clears throat> in branding Berlin as poor but sexy, and we now have young people from around the world flooding the city and making it a happening place. And artsy milieus have also, have also been used, this is a very different function, for pacification processes. I found that um, in, in Oakland, where I was two summers ago, when um, Occupy Oakland was still ruining the reputation of um, the city, with uh, being a, a, a little bit too, um, they were smashing up Obama's uh, election, uh, you know, campaign office and stuff. And so the city of Oakland used um, uh, what's called Oakland Art Murmur. Once a month on a Friday evening, all the artists put out their stuff and restaurants open and show exhibits and everything. And so the city seized on this and used it to play it up against Occupy Oakland. So um, in, in many places, city uh, governments and urban development actors have actual, actually institutionalized making use of various countercultural and alternative actors for their purposes, such as um, in Germany we have the Zwischennutzungsprogramm, so the city provides interim use of vacant space, old, industri um, old industrial factory buildings or, or other spaces to artists who don't have enough money to rent central city space, and thus it's a win-win situation for both empty city coffers and for precarious artists um, who need space for their own work. And uh, in Holland they have a similar um, program called Breeding Grounds, where the Dutch cities um, um, actually seek to, min to, to recreate the cultural functions previously performed by large squats. They even say that the, the big squatted buildings, which have been cleared but have been appreciated for their um, culturally attractive function, is now trying to be captured again through such interim spaces where they are letting artists temporarily use the space and make it interesting. So these creative city policies 
as I said, benefit both empty city coffers and precarious creative workers, as well as other groups whose talents and assets might be harnessed for cultural upgrades of the city, but who cannot afford the high cost of renting central city space. While thus beneficial, those policies at the same time, of course, hijack movement knowledge, civil society experience, and poor people's survival strategies for purposes of urban restructuring and enclosure. Hence, we may conclude that the appropriation of practices and principles that used to be rejected by mainstream policies, such as self-management, self-realization, and other unconventional or insurgent creativity, has become not only more easily feasible, but in fact a generative force in today's neoliberal city. In this ambiguous process, the formerly insurgent principles can easily lose the irritant edge that they used to entail in the context of an overbearing Keynesian top-down planning um, context of the city, but in today's neoliberal urbanism, they e frequently morph into essential ingredients of local or sublocal regeneration programs whose participatory structures uh, towards formerly excluded or stigmatized groups are often carefully designed to encourage self responsibility self-responsibilization and self-activation rather than actual political empowerment. So that's one set of movements. On the other hand, we have a set of policies that directly impacts the space and opportunities of another set of movements, which I sum up under the heading of austerity urbanism. And it includes austerity measures as well as repression, criminalization of undesired uses of the city. As the recent austerity cuts, especially in Southern Europe, but also all across the United States, have been hitting not only the traditionally disadvantaged, but increasingly youth, students, and more and more segments of the middle class, this punitive side of neoliberal urbanism is experienced by more and more people. But primarily, it's the weak and marginalized social groups that are confronted with this side of the neoliberalizing city. In spite of the new rhetoric of diversity and cosmopolitan openness, Many communities of color, informal workers, homeless people, the undocumented, and increasingly the new austerity victims, as well as protest movements, as well as urban rioters from the banlieues in Paris or inner city London rioters, have been confronting this rather repressive side of neoliberal urban politics increasingly stricter laws, tougher policing, disenfranchisement, and heavy criminalization of unwanted behaviors. I mean, a long list of examples uh, could be given here. A kid that <coughs> was caught mm, had um, stolen a bottle of water in the days of rioting in London was sentenced to six months in prison. And um, you can extrapolate that. The point is, as precious urban central space plays such a big role in interurban competition, urban policy makers seek to cleanse it of whatever might diminish its exchange value or might disrupt the exclusive commerce and consumption 
or the tourism that is supposed to take place there. At the forefront of this are ailing municipalities or cities on the brink of bankruptcy um, that have um, so little money that they are forced to um, make more drastic cutbacks, not only in their social programs and public infrastructures, but even in their police forces often. And of course, they have um, cut back the pensions of their public sector workers, and they are also curtailing unions and so the rights of, um, of the workers. Uh, so if you want to see what the future might look like, look at Detroit or Stockton, Vallejo, any of the de um, bankrupt American cities um, that have now fiscal emergency managers instead of mayors, or they still do have a mayor, but he or she has nothing to say. The emergency manager makes all the relevant decisions. It may look as if the social groups at that end of um, urban policy making have no resources or means to protest, but of course they do. Um, they do fight back, but wherever they do, they confront, um, if not deaf ears, far more restrictions, more surveillance, and more aggressive policing than their potential allies in the alternative or anarchist or countercultural scenes who have potentially marketable assets in today's creative city setting. While the latter receive concessions and offers for incorporation, the urban outcasts, as Louis Vacan calls them in his um, 2007 book, experience stigmatizing and repressive treatment, which exacerbates their disenfranchisement and also deepens the divides and the oppositions among the different groups locked out of or exploited by the neoliberal city and dispossessed in its crisis management. And local authorities frequently even exacerbate this distance and alienation between the groups that possess a certain leverage within the neoliberal city on the one hand and those that are stigmatized and othered. And even before any differential forms of state repression produce or intensify differences, there are huge distances in terms of cultural and everyday experience between the comparatively privileged movement groups and the outcasts. And even within the uh, different groups that make up the latter, different positions and thus different interests exist um, the homeless, the undocumented, the welfare dependent, the workers in informal economies, migrant youth, they all have very divergent experiences and therefore face widely different challenges, thus making it very difficult to join together in a common struggle. So that takes me to um, uh, mobilizations that are confronting this difficulty and under the right to the city umbrella they have, some of them have more or less successfully tried to um, bring some coherence into this fragmented urban terrain of um, social movements. As David Harvey has observed for the movement landscape in the neoliberal age in general, social activists have increasingly shifted to rights discourses. The slogans and mottos of urban movements have also adapted this general shift to social justice discourses by invoking the right to the city. 
while all the right to the city groups and initiatives, including the Zagreb ones, refer back to Henri Lefebvre's original definition of the right to the city as a cry and demand. Movements under this banner, in fact, comprise a huge variety of practices and goals, reaching on the one hand of the spectrum from groups and organizations that work to get charters passed, that seek to protect specific rights in the plural, in order to secure participation for all in the city, but in the city as it exists. <coughs> the assumption is there are just some that are even locked out of the city as it exists, and through some specific measures, even those marginalized people have to somehow be brought in. But on the other end of the spectrum, more radical movements seek to create the right to a more open, more genuinely democratic city through social and political agency. So in most Western countries, the networks and alliances that have coalesced under the motto of the right to the city are now um, compared to earlier um, urban movements, more heterogeneous, bringing together more different groups than in the 70s and 80s. So most activist networks nowadays consist of some combination of the following groups. Always some radical, autonomous, anarchist and alternative groups and various leftist organizations. Then middle class urbanites who seek to defend their accustomed quality of life against some onslaught of the neoliberal city, too much traffic or whatever. Then disparate groups that share a precarious existence, whether in the informal sector, in the creative industries or among college students. And that in itself is actually a wide group because it can involve very poor people, but also not so poor, precarious people. Then importantly, artists and other creative professionals, which may also cut across these different backgrounds, very frequently and here as well, environmental, local environmental groups that fight harmful energy, climate or development policies. And then there are the marginalized, excluded, oppressed, what are called people of color, that have not been so present in the coalitions that have formed in northern European cities, but that are very present in southern Europe, in Spain and Portugal and in Greece, and also in, in North America. You have Latino, Black, Afro-American, um, communities that form a very, very important part of right to the city coalitions. But in Berlin and in Hamburg, activists are having a very hard time reaching into or creating linkages with welfare recipients, migrant groups, those others. And they're very consciously aware of um, this problem with bridging the distances between the classical right to the city groups and those peripheral groups. So some groups within the Hamburg right to the city network have attempted to organize low income tenants and migrants in social housing districts that have come under increasing gentrification pressures in Hamburg Wilhelmsburg, as I mentioned uh, before. And they are extremely discontented with the neglect and disrepair of these quarters and the terribly inadequate services provided by the responsible social housing company that didn't heat during sub-freezing temperatures, for example. <clears throat> but in spite of this discontent, the right to the city activists managed to attract only very few residents to neighborhood meetings, which they called, and to involve only few local residents in their campaigns and actions. They very self-critically described their lack of adequate language, 
and the unintended result of finding themselves turned into residents' representatives instead of building joint struggles. So the residents would accept them only in their function as you represent us, you speak for us, but nowadays this is not what activists want, right? We do understand that the voiceless have to have their own voice, otherwise there won't be effective struggle. So they have not found a way out just yet. So because of such difficulties of mobilizing residents of downgraded marginal areas and of overcoming the distance between classical urban activists and those dispossessed even more severely by contemporary neoliberal urbanism, a movement sparked by migrant tenants in a former public housing complex uh, or district, I should say, in Berlin, was greeted with much excitement. You may have heard of Koti und Co. They named themselves after the central square around which the social housing complexes are con concentrated, Cottbusser Tor. This represents a rare instance where an action repertoire resonating with urban and occupy movements was kicked off by non-traditional movement groups. To protest rising rents in their previously social housing complexes, the low-income migrants and families on welfare in May 2012 erected a Getsche Kondu right there at Cottbusser Tor in the middle of that square, which is in the middle of Kreuzberg, invoking the informal settlements sprouting overnight in Turkish cities. They were soon supported by neighbors and activists who would bring food and who would volunteer for night shifts and by academics who helped organize a conference to pressure local authorities. This movement was initiated by Turkish longtime residents, many of whom had come to Berlin 30 plus years ago as guest workers when then blighted Kreuzberg was the only area where they were allowed to even settle. And <clears throat> over the years, they have helped turn this former problem area into an attractive multicultural district. They rehabbed together with the squatter movements, the old tenements that were slated for demolition and they made the drab Fordist social housing blocks come alive. They witnessed and welcomed the inflow of first students and squatters, then artists and gentrifiers, and more recently, masses of tourists and global residents choosing Berlin, often as their second or vacation homes. They have not been opposing the various waves of newcomers, even though particularly the latest wave has been driving up prices, housing prices, but also our prices. But they do demand a solution that will evo avoid their own displacement. Many of them are on welfare, and the welfare office demands that they find cheaper housing on Berlin's periphery. But they don't want to move to peripheral Marzahn. I mean, the peripheries may be the new center of the city, as um, global urbanism has it. But they have their networks and their social contacts and their history um, and familiar environment in Kreuzberg, and so they have organized and coalesced and formed alliances across large swaths of the city region by building links and organizing joint actions with other tenant groups, with anti-gentrification activists, with squatters, among them senior citizens who occupied their closed down community center in the far northern district of Pankow, who defended it for almost four months. So 70 plus year old people with their air mattresses were sleeping in their um, center for four months and succeeded. Um, 
So the activities of Cotty and Co. <clears throat> also invigorated a coalition scandalizing and frequently blocking the escalating evictions in Berlin called um, Coalition Against Forced Evictions. Then there is um, another recent mobilization, while not commonly viewed as an urban movement, um, I find also interesting because it indicates how in the northern European countries links might become forged analog analogously to North America and southern Europe between the relatively privileged and the outcast users of the neoliberal cities. And that's the new form of activism by refugees in Germany and Austria and the Netherlands <clears throat> also started in 2012 and is currently on the march from Strasbourg to Brussels. But I think I'm going on too long and so I won't go into much detail. Mm -hmm. I can provide more um, maybe in the discussion. Um, um, and, and come to just trying to draw um, a couple conclusions from um, these struggles. I don't know if you remember um, the, uh, the theoretical argument that uh, Nick Theodore and Neil Brenner and Jamie Peck developed um, in their conception of the global neoliberal project um, the, in the course of the post-2008 crisis management has set in motion a reconstruction of neoliberal rule that is becoming more multipolar and multilaterally entrenched. If that is the case, they argue, then its destabilization also requires a move from fragmented local experiments via more orchestrated systems towards a new rule regime of what they call deepening socialization. So this is a theoretically indicated reason why um, it's so important to form links between the fragmented local experiments um, that are popping up everywhere in these struggles around local commons and global, global commons. But there are also reasons of pragmatic feasibility um, because without support and without bonding, the movements of the vulnerable, be it the migrants or the homeless or the welfare recipients, will be overstrained and those of the comparatively privileged will lose their irritational edge and their irritant power. So for all these reasons, both types of struggles will need to be connected. The struggles of those excluded from the neoliberal city, be they at the periphery of this model, in the banlieues or ghettos, or invisibly servicing the privileged city users from their subliminal spaces and precarious um, spaces, will need to be supported if we want to make headway in destabilizing the neoliberal rule regime. So to that end, the more privileged urban movements need to add their leverage to the struggles against the exclusivity of neoliberal urbanism, as has begun to happen in the new collaborations um, formed in Spain and Greece between Occupy and Indignado activists as they went into the neighborhoods um, forming up um, new coalitions and <clears throat> with community organizations. And as has begun to happen around Cotty and Co. in Berlin and 
as is beginning to happen with the refugee struggles in uh, Germany and Holland. Um, and I'm sure you have not the same, but similar types of um, schisms, differences between more and less um, leveraged movement groups and probably also challenges in making them come together. So let's discuss similarities and differences. But first, I know I'm getting some feedback from Tom. Um, 